Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Katie Wyatt. I'm the president and CEO of El Sistema USA. I'm really excited to be here with my colleagues Armando Castellano, Ais Jamudi, Hello. Monique Van Willing, and Hilary Harder. Uh, because the conversation today is going to be very robust, we want to jump right to it. I do want to give a plug from El Sistema USA about a couple of conversations coming up. Um, I can uh, tell you the this afternoon at four o'clock, we're going to have a really interesting conversation with the Amani Project and uh, Matthew Stensrud, who is a music teacher, and we're going to be talking about uh, programming social emotional learning uh, through online programming. So would love for you to tune in today at four o'clock Eastern. Also next week, we're going to be hosting a listening session. You'll hear more about this coming up, but in response to the protests and in response to the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement now, in this time, we want to offer a moment for our members to listen and learn from one another. And that will be facilitated by our chair of racial diversity and cultural understanding, Kalita Jones and by the diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant that El Sistema USA has been working with this year, Dr. Raja Staggers Hakeem uh, from Yale. So really excited, excited. Excited is not the right word for the, what I'm uh, looking forward to, but I, I, it will be a robust and important conversation and we wanna hear from you. And so I'm, a, I'm a, I am excited to learn more and I am happy and so grateful for this El Sistema community in the way that we have responded to one another and supporting one another during this time. Uh, I want to hand it over to Monique Van Willing to further introduce our guests and to her co-chair, Hilary Harder. Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, everyone. We are so excited that you are here today. Um, and we are excited about this conversation because it's so timely. Um, and so just before we in, in, um, introduce our guests, um, we actually just want to set the stage a bit for where this conversation lays within sort of the, the larger macro conversation of what's happening in this country and around the world. You know, so linked to the murder of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and everyone else, and you know, all um, black and brown um, bodies that have been murdered due to police brutality. Um, and this conversation is really about, even though we'll be speaking about the repertoire as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a point into this conversation prospectively in our organizations, because we all need a starting point. Um, but this conversation is really about how do we shift structural raci racism? How do we shift um, systemic oppression? And what does that look like in the El Sistema field, um, in, in our communities, um, realizing and remembering that in El Sistema field, um, our students are predominantly Latinx and African American. Um, and our teachers are pre our teaching artists are predominantly white. You know, so what, what does this conversation then look like? Also, how does this all lay within the context, larger context of classical music um, and where that's situated um, and how that might be linked um, in some ways prospectively to um, in, in systemic oppression, sort of what is that intersection over there? So this is really what the conversation is about and our hope is that if, if um, that the repertoire, this is, this is something that we all are familiar with, repertoire, we all got a plan for it. And our hope is that that might be a starting point into this conversation that maybe starts at student level or teaching artist level. But the hope is really that, that things start to shift structurally around teaching artists, managers, directors, all the way up to the board. So what does this conversation really look like? And this is just our step one. Um, for the field. Um, so I'm going to introduce Aisha and I'll hand over the mic to Hilary. So Aisha Muda, Moody, thank you so much for being with us. Aisha is from Atlanta Music Project, a wonderful project in Atlanta, um, Georgia. I visited earlier this year and they're doing dynamic work with their youth. They just built a new center which looks beautiful and Yay. stunning. Yay, that's a yes. big, that's a Ooh, big thing. <laughs> their center is beautiful and now <laughs> It is amazing and their students and families now have um, sort of a musical home, you know, sort of home away from home. Um, and it's just so much dynamic work. And Aisha will be focusing on um, how they incorporated music from the African diaspora. It's sort of every student and all the ensembles had a whole semester of digging into this and how that lays within the rest of our program. So welcome Aisha, thank you for being here. 
Oh, thank you um, so much for having me. I'm very happy about this discussion. Awesome, thank you. And now I hand over to Hilary uh, to extend the combo and to introduce Armando. Thank you, Monique. And yeah, I just want to start by kind of, again, framing how it is that we got to this point. Um, so I met Armando actually about a year and a half ago at Sphinx Connect in Detroit. And I heard him speak about Quinteto Latino, his ensemble, which he'll tell you more about. Um, and it ever since then, we've actually had an email correspondence um, because it really just struck me the intentional programmatic choices that their ensemble was making. Um, and at that point, I was asking, how can the field of El Sistema USA, how can we learn from this? How can we emulate this? How can we start programming more music by Latin American composers? And Armando very gently but persistently pushed me to think, well, it's, it's not just about repertoire and it's not just about plugging in a few pieces here and there. Like, can we think bigger? Can we think about commissioning? Can we think about, so I've known Armando to be someone who's thinking with the big picture in mind all of the time and in our earliest conversations pushing me to do the same so um back in february then of this year um coming right out of the el sistema usa symposium and other conversations in the field this question of repertoire was really on our minds a lot in terms of how can our repertoire reflect the students that we're teaching in terms of identity culture heritage and I reached out to Armando and once again, he gently but persistently pushed me and said, that's not where the story ends. That's not all that this is about. We need to be thinking bigger. And so we actually were going to have that conversation in April, um, but we, we ended up pivoting to talk about COVID-19 and equity around technology and access during that time. And Armando and Aisha both graciously agreed to speak about this topic today. Um, and we couldn't have, anticipated the exact circumstances and events that are happening this week, right now, today, this year. <laughs> but um, the topic of repertoire, we decided was still relevant, but we wanted to couch it in much broader, much bigger picture terms than merely selecting pieces and plugging those in to our programs. We want to look at organizational shifts and an intentional approach um, to how we how we choose repertoire and really how our programs are structured. So that is a little bit of the trajectory of how we got to today. And I'm super grateful and thrilled that Armando is here to share with us. So Armando, I will hand it over to you. And just the, the question that we would like to explore today is, in your organization, how have you addressed structural racism through an intentional focus on how you approach repertoire? So thank you so much, Armando. Thanks, Hillary and Monique, and good good morning, everybody, or good afternoons for some people. Um, uh, thanks for asking me to do this call and talk about these this topic that is something actually I end up talking about every single day, um, whether I'm performing or teaching or even here in COVID. I'm having these conversations with mentees and organizations and it's a bit, it's a big pivot for me in terms of my work and advocacy. And um, what, one thing I just want to tell is a little bit about my story as a musician, and because I think it might be uh, similar to a lot of the stories for a Sistema students. I, um, you know, started playing the trumpet in the fourth grade. My parents said I had to take lessons. My, I'm Mexican American. They wanted a, their son to play mariachi, so I had to play trumpet. I actually wanted to play flute. But my dad made me play the trumpet. He chose for me um, because, again, I think he had mariachi dreams for me. Um, I fell in love with classical music. I also felt like music was the only thing I was good at at school. I had very low self-esteem. And uh, we lived in, we were the, one of the few Latino color um, families in that community and I experienced a lot of racism and otherism there. But music, I felt like I really belonged. And that was my place. And um, in high school, I switched to French horn. I fell in love with classical music. I started playing youth orchestra. And um, I, in high school, like so many, um, what I find a lot with a lot of kids of color who want to play classical music, and they, without the proper training, I didn't actually have lessons until I was much older. And, um, and I played a lot of different instruments. I wasn't super focused. And I, when I finished high school, I went to a community college and there I kind of started catching up. I started doing better in school. I started being, um, meeting a more diverse student base and teaching base. And I also um, was able to 
start practicing more intently, more purposefully, take private lessons, and kind of get caught up. And um, and I and I loved classical music, and I went on to UCLA where I studied Chicano studies and classical music. And what the problem was is there was no place where my life as a French horn player, buzzing my lips on this piece of metal, and my life as a Chicano studies activist, love of my identity, where there was no place where they were ever touching. They were completely different places. And all my Chicano studies friends were like, why are you playing the French horn? And all my orchestral music department friends were, what are you doing over there? It was super confusing for me, and I felt very tugged in so many ways. After undergrad, I went to Manhattan School of Music and I, and I got my um, degree in orchestral performance. But after that, I realized that uh, what a, um, the, something that really tugged at me was that there was no place where those two things met. And also I felt very cheated out of the fact that, uh, to the best of my recollection, that 100% of the composers I played were white and male. And I never once no etude, no solo, no scale, nothing was ever done or written for me by any people of color the whole time. And, um, and that, that made it actually hard for me to stay. And, and including the professors, uh, everybody, um, there was very little to no diversity in any of that. And, and so um, I actually got a job in a chamber ensemble and, and, and found through chamber music, I could make my own repertoire choices. So 17 years ago, I founded a wind quintet that only played Latino composers. Here's the point that you can play, you can have a professional touring ensemble that only plays Latino composers for 17 years of repertoire. There's boxes of repertoire I'll never be able to play and get to and that we can produce a whole arts organization around that. There's so many Latino composers and still so many presenters and uh, other artists can't believe that that's true because we're just, we're never given access to it. We've never told about it. We're never, those composers aren't talked about. They're not in the history books. They're just erased. And from our, our lives in classical music here in the US. So that's my journey. And um, Quinteto Latino is an advocacy organization with the Professional Chamber Ensemble. So we have advocacy programming around musicians, around composers, around arts equity, and the pipeline of music learning and arts learning and uh, audience development. So we engage with in, in, in consulting practice and in presenting practice around those four elements and our professional ensemble. I'm the French horn player in that group. Um, and and, and this, the, when you ask me about repertoire, Hillary, I think why I kept engaging with you around it and why I, I knew how to hold you in is because I get this question almost every week. There are some weeks where it happens two or three times. Now, remember, I'm, I'm a professional musician. I have an arts organization and I'm trying to engage around audience development, composers, musicians, and, um, and arts equity. That's already a lot. And I, and like the repertoire question, it overwhelms me because I, I know I've decided that I'm focused now on solo horn repertoire and wind quintet, but anything beyond that is just, there's so much repertoire for me to deal with. I, I can't even make um, good suggestions because there's, it's just overwhelming. So, um, but my point is that I do that repertoire because I want to make a point to classical music that there's so many composers and I get questioned so much. And there's people who are looking for these answers. I, mean, I haven't given any answers yet, but there's people looking for these answers about where to find the repertoire. But I wanted to set, make the case about why it's so important, why what it took away from me, never playing a composer that had a name that sounded like mine or came from my identity or any of my cultural or, or my spoke, nothing that spoke to me as a Mex third generation Mexican American or as a brown man in the US. So um, the question, when you ask me about repertoire, you know, I can, I can recommend composers, but it's just overwhelming. There's just so many to look at. There's places to go like Kayambas Music is, uh, is one of the publishers in the US that does exclusively Latino composers. It's a great place to start. Um, um, and, uh, he, and, and the owner is very nice about, like if you have a certain group or a certain level of music, he can recommend some or he'll, if he has some in the pipeline, he'll print them for you and sell them to you very cheaply. So there are some um, um, publishers that do that, that you can go to and ask for ideas. Um, and, and 
you know, in terms of repertoire for, for this age group and for my kind of my K-12 learning, we are also active teaching artists. I do a lot of residency work all over the country, uh, and, but especially regionally. And, um, you know, what I, what, what I bring is to, to, to add to the repertoire for my students, and some are instrumental, some have schools with no music programs or communities without any music, it's a big mix. We um, do, do commissioning of composers, so we'll bring a composer in and have them meet with the students and he'll write a piece based on the students' ideas, if it's an instrumental program. The students will write their own pieces uh, as well for the quintet to play. Sometimes we'll do like a concerto grosso kind of thing, so the students are playing and the quintet's up there playing with them, or we'll do side-by-side -side playing. And so, um, but we're always partnering with Latino composers specifically. And um, I'm always on the hunt for Latino composers to do commissioning, to partnering with, especially commissioning for kids. Um, this last year, we had four commissions for um, uh, pieces with composers and with kids. And the composer meets with the kids to have the piece done. But I think that ultimately what I was getting at Hillary when you asked me this is I wanted to talk about why it's happening and why, how we've come to this place and what we can do about it now, you know? And, um, and I feel like what I've been doing is just having a lot of short conversations like this and building awareness around why this is happening and why uh, our institutions are um, not diverse, at, top to bottom, funder to ED to the artist, all those, all those are, are very white spaces. And, um, and, the, and the people of color that are there, uh, I felt it myself and my, with my mentees, it's very hard for even them to stay there once they enter that space when you're the first one or one of a very few as a teaching artist or as a student or as a leader, as an ED, um, it's very hard to stay in that place because um, like me when I was in college and I felt very pulled from my identity and being a classical musician, I think that a lot of those people in those spaces feel the same way. They, they want to be able to express ourselves through their identity, but there's no place within our setup systems, within classical music, when even sometimes within El Sistema for us to be able to express that identity. And my biggest concern is that that transcends into the students. I'm, I'm grossly generalizing, but I think that this is a, a, a problem within, within our classical music systems that is evident. Um, um, so, so I think that there is a great need for, uh, to answer this question about Latino composers. And, and, but I also think that bringing anybody who is Latino or partnering with um, uh, someone in the community who's Latino or um, uh, seeking out, I spend a lot of time just trying to search for Latino musicians and partnering with them, thought partners or, um, um, uh, or literally playing partners or um, idea partners. Uh, repertoire partners that I meet to try to diversify the field, highlight their voice and have them inform my work. And I know that's, you know, when I, uh, I love that we're now doing more of these national calls and trying to inform ourselves um, to look beyond who's in our actual community to inform our work. This may be something that's great about this virus time, you know, that I, we can have these um, um, national calls and speak to each other like this. Um, so I, th I think that's enough set up. That's about the time. Um, you know, I want to hear from Aisha too. Um, a, a couple of things I wanted to add. One was that um, uh, I see that some people are putting in the, thanks for putting Kayambas Music, the publisher in the chat. And um, something I asked Hillary and Monique and Aisha to do is that if we, if you guys, if people on this call are feeling that they want to make a comment or um, uh, even ask a question or have something to say about what, Aisha and I are saying, I, we're going to keep an eye on the chat or want to follow up. And if we can follow up in even our regular talk or later during the question and answer, we'll try to do that. Um, but I want to encourage you to, you know, say whatever you want to say on the chat and we'll keep an eye on that too. So thank you. Thank you, Armando. And, and before we move on, just, I, I think 
uh, a question that I have and that we had talked about before yeah. uh, and that connects also with some things that are going on in the chat. So, for example, Whitney's question, do resources exist for teaching artists to find repertoire that's appropriate for different ages and ability levels by composers of color? So that was kind of my question when I first approached Armando was like, is there beginning string orchestra repertoire for that's written by um, Latin American composers? And Armando directed me to John at Cayambus Music Press and John and I had this great email correspondence and what both Armando and John really told me is there are so many living composers who are Latino who like we can be commissioning and in fact I think Armando you originally said to me like a commissioning consortium is really a more long-term sustainable really beneficial for the field sort of path to take um, so it, like if you're looking for some music kind of like graded repertoire for be, like beginning or intermediate string orchestra or other types of instrumentation, um, we can be commissioning that that work as well. So I wonder, Armando, would you want to speak a little bit more about what you t shared with me about a commissioning consortium and other ideas that you have around that? So um, uh, and, and um, because I get this question so much about repertoire, you know, I, I have to be, I'm only one person with one tiny organization trying to represent a big swath of the world, you know, like I can't, I can only represent my own story with my own resources and my very limited staff. And I know the way when, when people ask me that question about, um, um, uh, you know, K-12 existing repertoire, they're really I, ha I have my eyes and ears open for that. I'm not finding any, if very much of that. And, um, and so what, the way I dealt with that is through partnering, commissioning, and commissioning, and getting um, uh, just, just having pieces written and trying it out and, um, and, and getting funding to do that. You know? um, and, the, and the other thing I wanted to say is there's a, there is a, uh, and it's something that Angie Durrell just pointed me to in the chat because I think it's related to this part. And she's, uh, if you don't mind me mentioning your name, um, Angie, is that uh, the, the, she's asking me about classical music by Latin composers versus folk music and, and how we navigate that um, and those identities and those similarities and differences and, and whether that, count, that counts as classical music you know, and whether, um, and, and, and this goes back to a conversation that Aisha and I were having um, yesterday, which is about what is, what is palatable and what's acceptable to classical music audiences here in the US. Because they have a stereotype of what they think Latino music, classical music sounds like. And if you don't meet that demand, they're gonna be, they might be curious or they might be disappointed or they might be um, have have feelings that that make them not as engaged an audience member, and so just navigating the similarities and differences and defining them, and where maybe in Latin American culture they they have a, a better they mix more the 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 difference between the fine art and the folk art is it's more of a continuum, and here they're just a separate identities, you know, where there they might run across them and and. And Aisha can speak more how she deals with that, if there's any similarity there. But I just wanted to name that too. I don't have an answer. For me, I'm a classically trained, pure classical, fine artist. You know, I was raised in some of those folk traditions. I never played them. Um, and I, I, I understand them and I know what they sound like and they live inside of me, but I, I, I'm a trained classical musician. So I just wanted to name that piece and 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 what again what's palatable and what's acceptable for our audiences what engages with our musicians and audiences which one do we want? i don't have an answer but they're both exist do we play folk music with our classical instruments and vice versa partnering or just stick with the more of a classical um idiom um so i, I i'm 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 intrigued by that topic i hope i answered your question hillary <laughs> yeah no yeah definitely yeah. I think, I think something you and I had talked about was possibly having a group from El Sistema USA come together to form a commissioning consortium. Um, and so I guess an, an additional question for those of us on the call who might be interested in that, um, just to, of course, we can do this research and educate ourselves about that too. But if you have any thoughts to share about how to go about that, that might be helpful. So commissioning 
consortium. So, so um, like coming together and pulling money to have pieces commissioned, right? Is that what you're asking me? Um, and 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 what I here's what I here's what I have. Here's what our mom has: composers. Like I can recommend composers. There's composers in Latin America. There's composers that are born here and raised here. There's composers that came here from Latin America that I've worked with. You know. From that, na that are able to navigate these identity issues and understand um, what's what's culturally appropriate and have cultural competency around that, and 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 can meet those the the standards of uh, you know being being both the from a classical music standpoint and from their own cultural identity standpoint. Um, but I think I think the definitely coming together and commissioning works together would be not very uh, easy to do and inexpensive for a group of people. I've um, definitely see, I haven't done these co-commissioning projects, but I, I, there's other wind quintets that have done them too, very, uh, very successfully that I've seen. Yeah. Thank you. And th there's so much good stuff happening in the chat right now. Um, so thank you for those ideas, Whitney and others who are talking about the El Sistema USA community coming together to, to commission works um, and some of these other links. And, um, and Angie, so we're kind of moving into a time of question and answer right now anyway. Um, so Angie, you made some um, additional comments in the chat and I wondered if you wanted to elaborate more on that, if you're comfortable doing so. Yeah, um, happy to talk everyone. Uh, I'm Angie from Intempo in Stanford, Connecticut. And I think this calls for a separate conversation, but the reason why I signed up for this webinar was because I think it was, it had some, it said something about equity. And the, the mission of Intempo is not to really perpetuate, not to just perpetuate Western classical music as, you know, to me, I'm also a Latina violinist and playing classical violin was much better than playing, you know, mariachi violin. But that's really the issue that we as Latinos uh, are continuing to perpetuate and our families are continuing to struggle too. Um, because it's like, if you play Mozart, it's better on the violin, you're a better musician. But if you play mariachi, then you're not as good as a musician. And that's something that we are working to also, not necessarily dismantle, but say you can do both. And you can be a classical musician playing uh, cultural music as well. So I think I'm happy to talk separately or just you know, I'll definitely be reaching out to a lot of you guys because uh, Intempo has worked a lot on having, you know, a, a list of 45 pieces that have been orchestrated for youth symphony, native instruments, um, and uh, different levels. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there, but I do think that from an equity perspective, um, we're, we're continuing to per per perpetuate that Western is uh, higher than non-Western music. Thank you. Definitely a rich topic could be a whole call in itself. And, 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 and probably infuses a lot of the stereotypes and the uh, race equity issues that we as Brown performers um, experience and our students as well, for sure. Yeah, thank you, Angie. Uh, but yeah, I think it could be a whole other call. And we as the Equity Center and Pedagogy Working Group Committee, we are in process of determining what other topics we want to explore in future sessions. So thank you. And we might also reach back out to you. <laughs> um, at this point, I think we'll transition to um, giving Aisha time to share now, and then we'll do question and answer with Aisha too. And then we'll have um, a time when Aisha and Armando are speaking together. Um, so I'll hand it over to Aisha at this point. Hey, thank you again um, for having me here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Aisha Moody, co-founder and chief program officer of the Atlanta Music Project, and uh, or as we call it, AMP. And here at AMP, we serve our 350 students annually through our various programs. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about our programming and then a very specific program that we did. And I'll share with you uh, lessons that we learned in that process as it pertains to this conversation on equity and, and, and diversity and representation and rep. Uh, so um, we have after school programs where uh, we see students do the after school hours. And we also have um, those, three of those are orchestra, one is choir. Then we also have our official youth orchestras of Atlanta Music Project and youth choirs of Atlanta Music Project, which are audition only. And those uh, occur in the evening and on the weekends. 
We also have the AMP Academy, which is our private lessons program, which provides uh, free private lessons weekly to our most talented and dedicated students. And they do recitals throughout the year. And we have a three week uh, summer intensive called the AMP Summer Series, which is, which is a summer music festival and school. So throughout those programs, um, uh, so that's that's a little bit about AMP. But as far as this conversation, I think it's important for us to just say um, off, off the bat, that what we're talking about now, originally we were talking about rep, and then we, it, we merged this idea of discussing um, racism and uh, being anti or anti racist into the conversation because of current events. And if that's the approach we're going to take, I just think we need to be um, really clear off the bat that if we are dealing with um, programs that are serving black and brown children, then you have to be very intentional about everything that you do um within your programming which is why armando talks about funding a lot and he talks about everything in addition to to the rep because everything that we do affects uh the final product which is which is the artistic product so i just want to i want to make that point clear and uh say that here at amp we've always had a very heavy black presence for lack of a better term it's a black led organization um, the overwhelming majority of the people that we serve are black we are we are housed in in black communities and um, the majority of our staff is also black and we're, we're in atlanta so it all that that all makes sense so um bringing in diversity and inclusion hasn't necessarily been an issue for us because it's always it's always been present we've always done black composers uh, we've always done black music and to Angie's point, what does that mean? Um, we can talk about that. And um, we've always um, been intentional about bringing in guest artists that look like the students that we serve and make, and having conductors that look like the students um, that, are, that are playing on stage with them. Um, all of that said, there's still room for growth um, for AMP and for all of our organizations. And I think when we enter into this conversation, it's important that we know that everyone has to do a, a uh, uh, an amount of self-reflection, because um, if, when we're talking about um, racism or the myth of white supremacy, that permeates pretty much every aspect of the culture that we exist in. And um, it's up to us to find it within our programs and root it out and destroy it, or else we will serve it unconsciously. And so you have to have a conscious mind to go in, find it, and root it out and destroy it. Just like for these systemic programs, we tend to serve underserved kids. Well, uh, or under, to kids in underserved communities, so to speak. And they may not know about the program because their parents may have three jobs. Uh, they may be busy doing this and this and this. And sometimes the students from the wealthier communities find out about the program and say, wow, this is great and it's free. And if you're not careful, you'll be serving 80% um, wealthy and not the, and not the the group that you're looking for. So how do we combat that here at AMP? We go and we find them. We go overboard to make sure that we are serving the people that we initially set out to serve. If not, it's not going to happen. It's just it's just not going to happen. So we have to do our part to make sure we're serving those students. The same applies to every aspect of AMP, um, including the rep. Our mission is to empower underserved youth to realize their possibilities through music. So I tend to look at it not through the negative lens or let's fight racism and, and, and fight white supremacy, but through the positive lens or I'm just empowering people that live in this world where they are oppressed and they are not um, acknowledged for their humanity at times, but uh, doing music is what I know how to do best. So through my music, I will empower them to be the best people that they can be. And that makes sure that requires me to make sure that I am empowering myself to bring my best self to the table so that I can in, in turn bring out the best out of them. So um, with that said, we did a, a concert series um, a, a few months ago in February, Black History Month, um, called Music of the African Diaspora. Now, as I said, um, doing uh, music like this is not necessarily new to AMP. Um, since the choir program started in 2013, we've always done a Black History Month program. Uh, but what we wanted to do was kind of go all out this year. So we had several, um, out of the, all those programs I mentioned, we had several that had performances scheduled in the month of February. And we said, you know what? They're all gonna do Black History Month themed um, um, concerts. We're just, we're just gonna do it across the board. And so the, the youth choirs did um, a, a concert, the youth orchestras did a concert, and then all of our academy, the private lesson students, they all had their recitals. That's 75 um, young musicians. And to the point that was made, some of them are, are young and pretty new on their instruments. And no, there was not a lot of rep. But again, we had to go out 
and find it. And I would love to see a resource because there's always somebody out there that I haven't that I haven't heard about. Um, but uh, to Armando's point, you have to put your money where your mouth is. And so we did commission a couple of pieces. Um, we have a, um, a couple of composers on staff. Um, so we use some of those works. Like we, we used what we had to make sure that they had the best experience and not just say, oh, well, this this will work because, you know, and we didn't go for the, the okie doke, the, the, the usual suspects. Uh, well, these are the five songs that you hear at a Black History Month program. Let's just do these. Obviously, we had too many too many performances to just rely on five pieces. So we had to pull a lot of music. So we pulled it from everywhere. Um, and uh, in, in that we did, uh, so I said we did youth orchestra, youth choir, and the, re, and the academy students did a recital. And all of them did music of what we call the, the African diaspora. Um, I think that's important as well to just, so that's the why, why we did it, but it's also to talk about the, um, the title because uh, before we had a Black History Month concert, which is fine, but if I were to you know, put any of you guys on the spot and say, when you think about, you know, if your niece had a Black History Month program that she was in, she asked you to come to it, what do you think you're gonna see there? And you would probably think, okay, maybe, you know, reenactment of, you know, on Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of slavery stuff, civil rights stuff, that's, that type of thing. There's more to the Black experience than what we typically find at a Black History Month program. And I'm not knocking anyone's program or any of the programs that I've done in the past because I've done a gazillion Black History Month programs. But um, what we wanted to do was celebrate the beauty and the diversity of um, the culture of people of African descent. And so entitling it Music of the African Diaspora that uh, allowed us to say peoples of African descent, those that may, may be in Africa, right now or scattered to the islands or any any of the continents we are acknowledging the the music that was was born of their experience and so that allowed us to go um to think of it in a new in a new way to approach it differently and so we did have uh you know um, samuel kohler's teller which you you might expect uh on the orchestra side moses hogan on the choir side but we also had at the Academy recital, we had a bassoonist playing Shoshaloza on bassoon, which I never heard before, you know, anything like that. We had um, um, a Cuban composer. We had uh, composers that the students had never heard of. You know, we were in rehearsal and it was like at the first or second rehearsal getting ready for this concert. And one, one of the um, a viola said, wow, I love this. This is, this is amazing. I love this new piece, but what does this have to do with Black History Month? I said, well, the composer, the composer is black, what? I didn't know. So it's like opening their mind to 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 new to new musicians, new new people that you know they would have they wouldn't have known about otherwise. So those are a couple uh, some of the things that we um, learned along the way. Music was it was challenging. It took people um, out of their comfort zone, uh, so to speak. Teachers and and students. For some of our teaching artists, um, they weren't accustomed to finding that much music. Um, that fit that criteria. So we did have to dig deep and, and be creative and not just give them something to say, well, this is black, so do it, because we still have this, this standard that we wanted to adhere to. So that was one thing. And it also took some of our students out of the comfort zone. We were there at the AMP Center one night and get, one student was getting ready for a recital. He was playing a, a, a spiritual on double bass and he played it beautifully. And Dante said, yeah, that's great. Now I want you to swing the eighth notes. And we were there for at least another 30, 40 minutes trying to get him to understand the feel of the piece and how to swing the eighth notes. So he walked away swinging the eighth notes because it was a jazz, it was a jazz, um, it had a jazz feel to it. It was a spiritual with the jazz tempo. So we're like, hey, this is how you need to perform this piece. But it was, it was a little bit foreign to him. And so AMP is structured in a way that no student will ever say, ever say what Armando said earlier, that you know, 100% of the composers were, uh, were, were white males. That's not gonna happen at AMP, but just because they are not able to make that statement doesn't mean that they are fully understanding music of the African diaspora, and it doesn't mean that their culture is being celebrated. So there's always more work for us to do um, in that arena, and we, and we learn that, I guess, um, doing this series. Um, One other uh, point I wanted to make. Oh, when you when we talk about moving um, outside of outside of your comfort zone, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of uh, uh, fear and, and, and trepidation. Like I don't know, I'm not really familiar with this with this genre, or I don't really know how to approach it. So I just kind of shy away from it and go with what's easy. 
Um, for example, I used to be a public school music teacher and we had our national music standards. And um, every year without fail, when we would come to the music teacher meetings, the discussion was on the standards that were getting uh, ignored or overlooked. And they were, it was always composition and improvisation because a lot of the teachers were not comfortable um, in that area. So if you don't know it, you can't teach it. And so they just kind of stayed away from it. And I see that happening sometimes in other programs where I don't know, I, don't, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't taught this, so I'm just gonna let it go. Well, you don't have to know everything. Um, my team hears about, hears me say this all the time. I have no shame in saying, I make sure that I hire people that are better than me. Um, they have to be, if not, why, why are they here? You have to be better than me in some, in some way, shape or form, a better singer, a better player, a better composer, better teachers, better something, because I want all, I want the best for the students that I serve. And I know I don't have all of the answers. So when I get, you're the best at this, you're the best at this, you're the best at this, now we have a dream team and we can really make some magic. And that's the way that we operate at AMP. The same thing applies to this, um, this concept of, of bringing in very, you know, diversity within your rep. You don't have to have the, the expert on staff. You can bring in someone and bring in the best. Bring in someone that you know will give the students an authentic experience so that, it, you're, so that you don't feel like you're just tokenizing the whole thing. You know, bring in, if, if I'm doing a wind quintet thing and it's Latin composers, I know who I'm calling now. I'm not gonna pretend that I have the answers. I'm gonna, he's gonna get a phone call and say, hey, can you make it to Atlanta? Let's do this. You know, and it's not, um, it's not patronizing him. I am honoring him for his expertise and, and not just um, watering it down to give something to say, well, I did it, we did it. So I think that's, that's really important to just uh, keep that in mind when we're doing that. But that forces you to have, again, some retrospection and conversation with yourself on, you know, what am I really, what your intentions are and what am I really bringing to the table? We know as teachers, um, when you teach, it's, what do they say, like 90%, it's who you are as a person. You're bringing who you are as a person to the table, not just the concept. It doesn't matter what you're teaching, math, music, social studies, your values, your ideals, your, your knowledge, that is what you're bringing to those students when you stand in front of them. So it's important to remember that in music, like what are we bringing to the table and what are we bringing to these students? Uh, and uh, one other point I wanna make, because this is a systema, um, group here. Um, a lot of us in, in this, on this call may have started our own programs or you're working with someone that started their own program. Um, and a lot of our under institutions as well, but Systema Field, people tend to have a lot of um, a, a, a say so and how the program is run. And so we, I hear the conversation about, you know, um, uh, not, seeing, not seeing faces that look like you when you go to the opera or go, you know, uh, when you see, look at these orchestras. And you know what can we do about diversity? But I tend to say we are the they. It's always well, they don't include us, or they don't do this, and they don't do that. But but we are the they because the future generation are the ones that we're we're training right now. And if we provide them an environment where they are um, included and celebrated and acknowledged uh, from the jump, then they will be their authentic selves. You know wherever they go in life, and so they won't they won't wait for the they to give them permission to do um, a, a wind quintet that does only uh, Latinx composers. They're not gonna wait for the they, they realize we are the they. And so at AMP, we sort of operate under that premise. We don't, I mean, if you know me, if you know Dante, we don't really ask for permission, we just, we just do it. And you know, kind of is like, well, if you're gonna get in trouble, get in trouble later. But we, we're fighting, um, we're, we're, we're at war, like uh, Tukari Luchar, everybody knows that, that model because it's, it's real. We're fighting, like we have protests happening every day right now because of the lack of humanity that's shown to, to black bodies publicly publicly, you know, for you to see, for you to view, and for you to get that in your psyche and learn the lesson. We're at war. And so I don't know how to, how to fight. I don't know how to do a lot of things in life. I know how to create music with young people. So if that's what I do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability because I'm going to fight this war in my lane. And my lane is through AMP. So I'm not going to tread lightly when it comes to empowering these young people. I'm not going to tread lightly when it comes to giving them full representation and making them aware that, yes, you matter. Even when AMP first started, we were very intentional, again, about bringing them to fine facilities in Atlanta and the nicest venues so they would know you belong here. You belong on this stage. It's not just for other people. It's for you as well. All of that matters. So um, I just would like to encourage everyone to be fearless. 
um, in their attempts to bring diversity uh, to the stage and uh, in the way that they um, address uh, uh, our, our young people or, you know, hesitancy on your part, you know, do the work so you can get over it and bring in other people that'll help you do the work to get over it. But, you know, it needs to be done. That's it for now. We'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aisha, uh, for your words. <laughs> so well said. So yeah. well said. Um, and I, I have a question. Maybe just kick off if there are other questions that are coming in for Aisha specifically um, just over these next few minutes, and then we'll transition to a conversation with Armando and Aisha. Um, so, Aisha, can you speak a bit to um, how your African diaspora um, repertoire? session which i think was a semester if i'm correct how does that fit how did it fit into your whole year plan and then what do you what are your thoughts for next year so those of us who might be planning this whether as teaching artists or directors managers um what is your thought space and your planning space and maybe how did you activate this conversation with your teaching artists mm -hmm. okay so it was um not a semester but a concert period we have three concert periods uh, throughout the whole season and the first concert period is, is the fall and then this semester that we're in now or that just ended um, there are two concert periods and so this was the second of the two concert periods and of course the third we shut down for COVID um, so that whole concert period was focused on music of the African diaspora um, next year we're absolutely doing it again and uh, and the thing is I say this again it wasn't anything new really so to speak it's just you know I mean we're all we run our programs. We know the power of marketing. We've been doing Black History Month concerts every year, right? Uh, but this year we added a third recital for the Academy and we said, well, they're doing another recital. It's going to be all Black music. That's, you know, it, and this is really by popular demand. So we're like, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, everyone is going to, a Black composer or music that reflects the African, di music of the African diaspora. Um, and then for the youth orchestra, they hadn't done something along this line, so to speak, like they had done Black composers, but not boldly in your face like it's going to be all black composers or all music of the African diaspora so we said everyone's going to if you have a show in February you're going to do that and then we packaged it and said let's just put it all together and call and and call it you know a concert series because people love things to be in nice packages you know so it makes it it makes it you know more easy for the for our um, supporters to digest and then we just blew it up you know we did a press release we did an email blast we did mailings we just went completely overboard with this music of the African diaspora series so that it would be in people's minds like, yes, this is something that AMP is putting, you know, front and center. Uh, so yeah, we'll do it again. We'll definitely do it next year. Um, how does it fit in? Um, I think it, I, we, we try to um, empower our youth to uh, really take ownership of their art, artistic journey and of the program in general. And I think for them to see that up front they know this is a program that will allow me to be my my true self and to and will celebrate me um and i think that well i think that's the the the, the end goal you know for them to have that 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 sense of empowerment and i think it'll affect the way they approach everything that they do at amp you know so if they're doing something like, ah, i don't know about this but i know i know we have this coming so it's like it sort of balances things out Thanks, Aisha. Um, and so um, if there's anyone who'd like to ask a question to Aisha, get ready. And as you're doing that, I just want to highlight three things that I maybe want to pull out um, um, from what Aisha just mentioned now. So just the thought about youth voice and agency. You know, if our students are students of color and we are working in these communities, what does it look like to bring in the voice of families and students in terms of assets-based community development that really develop from the community? So what does that look like? I see in the chat box, speaking about, you know, if these institutions around us um, are not shifting. Remember, systemic oppression happens at multiple levels. It's individual, then it's community, then it's um, organization, then it's sort of systemic sort of institution policy. So thinking through where in that trajectory is our sphere of influence. And if those around us are not shifting, what is our responsibility? And maybe I just want to do, say to that, that this in this time of black liberation, and there's so much more, this black liberation, but there's also immigrant life, rights. We had LGBTQI plus um, Pride Week last week. So there's, there's so much that needs advocation. But right now that fight and that luchar is about black liberation. And so it's the time of boldness, I think. And it's the time of boldness, compassion and collaboration. So I would say that, you know, if, if something's not happening in our community, let us be that activator. 
call up whomever and say, hey, mm-hmm. let's collaborate. Let's start a group. Let's do this thing. Can we collaborate? And I think online um, actually provides that space so much um, better. And then I saw Rodrigo. Um, thanks for joining, Rodrigo um, Guerrero, who uh, joined us today. Um, he was talking about how Tukari Luchar and the Luchar can take many forms. Sometimes it's teaching and sometimes it's admin. So a lot of the time it's going to be us actually advocating upward or sideways and, and in those moments of boldness saying like, hey, no, I, I don't think we should do this. So this is not right or this does not look like equity. What do you think? Um, yeah. So I just wanted to um, pull in those thoughts. Amanda? Yeah, address a couple of those. Um, and, and, you know, this idea um, of partnership and I like what uh, Rodrigo said about luchar, which means to fight, you know, and the, what I've been talking about with my mentees and other thought partners and, peer, and, and, and people doing this work just in the last few weeks. Look at we have a moment of open hearts. People more than just, you know, uh, folks of color, but other people in charge are looking at where they have um, perpetuated these systemic inequalities and their hearts are open, okay? Funders, EDs, partners, and I'm trying to spend as much time right now stepping in and moving my race conversation to a deeper, more politicized stance because their hearts are open and doing an ask right now, asking them for change. So getting on the phone, sending the emails, making the appointments, putting in time right now to do those asks to, to to more towards equity and, and being able to have an open conversation about racism. You know, and, and there are some other ideas in the chat about partnership. Like I have been navigating partnership, you know, being a brown led, a brown serving, and I wanna say we are a seven person board um, with uh, uh, six Latinos. So you can have a classical music organization with people of color at the helm, okay? It is possible. Now, um, Quinta Latinos board is six out of seven are Latinos. And, and so my, my point is that, that there's, there's the partnering with our, my regional classical music institutions, okay? I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is, that you know these uh, orchestras are very entrenched top decision making just like a conductor conducts orchestra i feel like in the admin side even the conductor even controls some of them and their decision so if if i'm if i'm close with the conductor it works otherwise it doesn't and and the change is so within those systems is really really slow so i find the partnership they're they're not as nimble and as fluid in the conversations and the programming as me as a chamber ensemble and, a cha- and an organization led by folks of color entrenched in classical and contemporary music is. So that's a, that could be a problem. So um, my, what I, and if, you, if I wanna have authentic cultural partnership, I often have to look outside of my classical music institutions, okay? Um, so just as a, as a way of being able to um, serve the communities I want to serve and have authentic, culturally competent partnerships. And the other thing I was going to mention, because it was, a th- um, we were talking about Black History and Black History Month and Black History Programming. Um, one thing that I, I learned over the years is that Cinco de Mayo, I get all kinds of calls. It's Cinco de Mayo time. Let's call Armando, you know, and, and so a couple things. First of all, it's an opening for a conversation about why you just call me on Cinco de Mayo. Number two, happy to do it, gonna charge you double. Okay, I, um, and um, uh, I can be that person for you. And I do have long-standing residency partnership consulting works with, with orchestras and with regional presenting organizations that are white-led and white-driven. Um, and, and I can be a brown voice as a consultant. And I feel like I do promote change and bring money into my organization and serve my communities when I can be that voice for them. So there, I found ways to partner that are both authentic and that are invoiceable and, um, and that serve my community and, um, and, 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 and enrich the power of their voice, the communities that I'm serving. Um, but the, I, it's been a lot of learning about how to have an authentic, um, conversation, you know, often another tool I'll use is I'll have, they'll ask me for a partnership 
and I'll get them super excited about what's possible. And then I'll bring in the race and the identity, you know, and later in the conversation, after they're already excited about all the different things I do just as a classroom musician, and then I can bring that discussion in and then their, they, their, their hearts are more open for that. So just a couple of things on partnership. And I get, I think we're at a special moment and then this, this week, next week, hearts are open. So now's the time to do these asks. Thanks, Armando, for those wise words. Uh, wise words. We appreciate it. Um, and just before we have sort of the collective conversation with Armando and Aisha, um, I just wanted to take a few moments in case anyone has questions for Aisha and M. Just any, any questions about what you heard? You can chat in the chat box or just unmute yourself and go for it. Any questions? I have a question. Can I ask? It's Armando. Do it. Okay. I... I am blown away by um, AMP. I am just totally <laughs> blown away at the concept. Um, the things that are amazing to me is that it's color found and uh, color driven and color owned and, and, and the incredible growth and authenticity and um, of your programming and how thoughtful you are about the communities you serve. And I just, I just want to take a second how, I mean, I have my eye nationally on organizations like you. So unusual, so unusual. I just want to applaud the amazing work that you guys done. You have a building and how long have you been around? 10 years, nine 10 years? years. Yeah. That is, and, 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 and why I'm so amazed about that is because what in, in general within philanthropy and within nonprofits, color led, and, and this is what I want to, uh, you know, what, if we want to talk about race equity, color led organizations, and nonprofits are funded at in much, much lower rates. Of all philanthropy in the United States, 1% of dollars go into the Latino community. So of 100% of philanthropy, the billions of dollars that go out every year in the US, 1% go into the Latino community. And it's a very similar percentage for other communities of color. So to see that you have, you have overcome that, Aisha, as an organization, and found and, and, and had this much success and to, uh, to have your own building and still be navigating your identity is, is really profound. So I just, um, um, I don't know, what's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I think there's that's a lot of lessons in that. I'm like, what's your secret? We don't, we don't, we don't have, it's, that's like when you go to Venezuela and they're like, oh, what's the secret? And you're like, oh, it's just good teaching. And they're just, you know, unrelenting in their pursuit. Is that what it is? It's the teaching? Is that what it is? No. I mean, there's more to it than that because you had Abreu saying this, I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen and I'm going to make sure that it, that it continues to happen. Um, I mean, I mean you're I, navigating I, white systems and, 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 yeah. and, 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 and still doing it successfully. How, how do we do that? I mean, okay. Something we've known inherently, but it uh, we've articulated it more in the last year or two is that as an arts nonprofit, like you're, you're a business and you just have to accept that. Like a lot of our Sistema, mm. especially um, organizations, they're run by musicians. It's just like AMP, right? Um, I don't have a, um, an MBA, neither does Dante. Now we've done a lot of programs since we did the fellowship. So we did the fellowship at NEC. Um, but that's, that's 10 months that will not give you everything you need. That's, that's a Kickstarter. And then yeah. you do what you do with Keep it. Keep learning. So, yeah. So exactly. Since then, you know, we've kept learning, but, um, you have to face the, face the music. And the truth is you're a business and you have to run your business, but you're like, no, I'm an artist. Yeah. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. But this is, this is a business. And so it, it's, as we grew, it got to the point where, you know, um, it, it used to be that, you know, Dante was the ED and he would really oversee the orchestra side and I would oversee the choir side. And, uh, you know, we would grow and grow and our team is amazing. So we have a great board and we have great teaching artists who understand the mission, love, you can't, you can't serve the people if you don't love the people and you can't love the people if you don't know the people. But we have teaching artists who do all of those things. They know our families, they know our students, they love them, they'll go to bat for them the same way I would. So we have all that working in our favor, but, as you grow, um, but Dante and I were still doing a little bit of everything. Everything. I just want to, can I say something as a friend and knowing you guys hey. for 10 years? Hi, Bear. 
I think also AMP didn't say yes to everything. AMP and Aisha in the way that she described seeking it, she wants people better than her. And, and the way that she described her hiring process for teachers is the way that AMP has approached everything that they do, including good partnership opportunities and um, seeking funding relationships and board members. I, I think we, in a startup mentality, are often like, yeah, we'll jump in, we'll collaborate, we'll mm. partner, yeah, we'll do that, we'll show up for that, I'll give you my time, I'll give you my kids, I'll give you my, I'll give, 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 give. I have really respected how AMP has been kind of relentless in its focus over the years about we're working on us. We're working on these kids. We're working on this project. We're working on this community. And that this is, Aisha, I would love for, to know what yeah, you think you have about to that. Drive, but that has been yeah. my perception. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you have to drive the ship. There's, there's no, you can't, you, you can't, you can't give anybody else the wheel. You, you have to drive the ship because no one is going to be as committed to this mission as you are. And, you know, I did not birth these children, but you see them as your children and it is up to me to get them from, they don't, nobody knows what they're signing up for when they sign up for AMP. They have no clue. It's like, oh, this is cool. I'll learn an instrument and it's free. You know, they have no clue. We're like, you don't even know, like we're about to take up all your time, we're about, but then we're going to take you places you never dreamed of going and it's going to change your whole family. You have no, they have no clue. You couldn't know. Right. And, and the teaching artist also is like, oh, this is great. Sounds wonderful. You know, a great, you know, feel good project, but it's, it's dirty work. Like AMP is not for, for the week. You work, you have to work really hard, you know, and it's challenging when you're dealing and when you're in communities where things are not set up for success, you have to navigate that. You have to you have to make things work when when things don't necessarily want to work. And so you have to come with the mindset that I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and I'm gonna get dirty. It's dirty work, you know, but and then back to my initial point. And that's a great point, Katie. And, you know, thank you for that. No, when we, we all have our moments where we we do what we have to do to be seen. But we did try to have, you know, keep our, our, our vision in mind the whole time. Number one. Number two, we always in keeping your vision in mind, we always um, uh, 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 approach things as if we were um, where we wanted to be. So I remember um, like in year two or three, I, I would get calls to, you know, to do whatever. And people are like, oh my God, it's just you two? Because it was just us two. And like, we thought you had a staff of 10 people, you know, from looking at our website. I said, oh, that's really cute. No, it's just two people doing everything. But we presented ourselves in such a way. And that goes back to something that Armando and I talked about yesterday, this old um, phrase in the black community that's not going to go anywhere anytime soon, which is you have to be twice as good to get where the same place where, where whites get. And, uh, you know, I grew up in the South. I, I was I was raised with with that belief in mind. Dante's parents are, are are immigrants, so I know he came with that mindset, you know. And it's not that oh I'm I'm oppressed. I have to be. It's just like it's it just ingrains in you this hard work ethic. We work really 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 hard, you know. And we don't take no for an answer, and we don't give up on our vision. So that's number two. And number three is back to my point about being a business. Um, it got to the point where we realized we can't do everything. As much as I love working with young people, Katie, I've been to your program, you know, I love it. You know, I could just do that all day. I can't do that all day though. I can't because I have to make sure that AMP is good, which means I have to step back and trust someone else to go to Katie's program and do a seminario, you know, and if they're not, if they're not qualified to do it, then maybe I shouldn't have hired them in the first place. So I want to make sure that I bring in people that I trust to go do that because I have love and respect for Katie's youth the same way I do mine, because I know where Katie came from, which is the same program with the same vision, the same mission. And I know she's trying to do the same thing in North Carolina, you know? And so it got to the point where Dante and I said, okay, we're taking steps back and he's got, I'm gonna focus solely on the institution and fundraising and Aisha, you're gonna focus solely on programming. And that was hard. That was like cutting the strings because we were so used to being like this all the time, but it, you can't do that. You know, so once we separated and I focused on on the, the art and he focused on making sure that, you know, we, we stayed in existence, um, and then we, that cycle, it started running a little bit more smoothly. Um, but I just, I can't overemphasize the, um, the fact that you have to think of yourself as, as a businessman or a businesswoman, you know, um, and, and understand that that product means everything. And the, also, I didn't talk about this, but it's really important, this whole conversation about excellence versus access, uh, because people 
you know, Armando has his questions all the time. Well, this is a question we get all the time where you're, you're giving access. So how do you um, do excellence versus access? The, the, the idea is that you have to choose. You do not have to choose. You, oh, I will not choose. It's, it's a yes and, you know, yes, we're giving access to those that otherwise don't have it. But excellence is, is that's, um, that's a non-negotiable. You know, and so as and as we see in Venezuela and other programs, nobody would know who Dudamel was. Nobody would would care about. We didn't. We wouldn't have, have had a fellowship. We wouldn't have Systema USA if the product wasn't excellent. But because that product was excellent, it got it garnered attention and it put them on a platform that made people want to stop and pay attention. And uh, so we can't forsake that when we do our programs. Uh, you know, you're they're not going to want to do it if it's not really good, you know, and, and, and your staff won't want to be there because like, oh, you know, it's fun, but it's like, you know, it's just a regular summer camp. I can go do any summer camp. No, you want to come here where I'm making music and I'm doing something that's meaningful and they get a thrill from it just the same way they do when they play with their peers, you know, so I can't overemphasize that one either. <laughs> you know, the, the excellence, it has to be there. And that's why AMP has achieved whatever level of success that we have is that we, we try not to bend on that. Awesome. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Armando in a sec. I just want to pull out two things that I felt just rose for me. This is for Monique in this, in this con um, current conversation is in a sense, how do we center the voices of color? And centering of the voices of color goes from subtly in our conversations, um, really making sure that, that the voices of color have a chance to speak and have their full say. This is very important. So for those of us who are not in the minority, we've got to be really careful about this. We've got to send to our voices of color. So that's important. And then representation is key. If we sort of have an all white board, all white teaching staff, then of course this whole um, thing is going to be much more difficult. For, so for those of us who are hiring, even those of us who are teaching artists, we can advocate. We're like, we need more voices of color or black and indigenous folk um, in, in, in our um, communities that's teaching us. So I just wanted to pull that up um, out as I thought uh, at something might be important. I do want to refer to a question, then I'll hand over to Armando, um, who sort of may speak to this question or speak to it later. So Rachel was asking, do you suggest that organizations speak to their own funders and challenge them to increase funding to POC-led arts orgs? And then Armando wanted to speak to sort of folk music versus classical music. So Armando, take the mic. Yes, to that question. Do it now. Call them right now, please, because <laughs> Now what happened time. the last two weeks, their hearts are open. They're ready to speak. I am not kidding. Yes, like go. And whoever's in the highest, I always try to reach for the highest powered person. I put on my best shoes, wear a nice shirt, and I make sure I'm shaved and looking good as a man of color. I have to do that. And I talk to the highest person in power. And I, and I mimic their power in the best way I can. And I, I do the ask. And I'm really now, right today, it's got, it's got to happen because it's going to close right back up. We know these cycles of opening and closing in terms of um, their ability to, um, to have this conversation. Um, I, wanna, I just want to speak, Aisha, to something about excellence. And, and it might be different than what you're talking about in terms of what I've been trying to espouse with my presenters in terms of working with youth and youth of color or with youth that don't have any music program and sometimes I'm doing a residency and what quality and excellence is. And, and it's something that I learned from Lacoli in Washington at Boston um, uh, Community Music Center and which is around um, the idea of quality and excellence being about, uh, you know, part, part of it is pedagogy and just having the skill set, you know, having done your, your work, your due diligence to do that. And then um, that, the, that it's, it's, it's somehow aesthetically pleasing to, to the listener. So there's a, you know, the qualities here in their ability and that they convey that quality and that beauty to the listener. But, and, and I've been trying to pitch a third one that I learned from him, which is about cultural competency. So it's not just about the, the ability and not just about the, the inherent pleasure of the listener, of the audience, but that, that it's culturally competent and aware. And I just want to, I want to put a plug out for that because it reminded me when you said that about access and you're doing all of those, you're doing very, you're navigating perfectly and you're promoting that last one around cultural competency. Um, but um, uh, we tend to over-focus in classical music on the ability and the inherent beauty. And I want mm -hmm. to, you know, talk, have a, a, a systems, classical music systems conversation about cultural competency as well. Um, 
What, what you know? What I was mentioning to Monique in in between was something I'm seeing in the chat um, that we that we already touched on was um, classical musicians and their their quality and and El versus a folk mariachi or some other folk musician and the quality of them. And here's what I here's what I've experienced just for me. When I play with mariachis, okay. When I when I, I have some projects where I do play with mariachi, I'm the only classical musician. Or I've been in Mexico and there's like folk musicians mixed with crossover musicians with with fully classical musicians and all of us mixed together. And what I find is all the folk, the folk artists and folk musicians, are 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 very clear that their quality is lower than mine, and their musicianship is less. That that's an an internalized, colonized, um, uh, 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 othering, undering of themselves that they've been taught by society. They're in, it's an internalized, internalized, colonized, um, you know, uh, 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 thought process, and um, I'm ha I, and and like or like mariachis. I've done years and years of projects, and they still say it over and over again. And I and I can I can never convince them. I'm I, I'm learning as much from them as they're learning from me. I mean, I'm and my heart is open for that learning too. And I internalize it and I actually do it and I speak to it and I use what I learned there in my classical music space as well. But I just um, this is this is a uh, uh, you know um, a, a, a colonized aesthetic that we need to try that I you know by myself I feel like and I'm glad that's happening here. Try to talk about. Um, it, it, you know, one at a time with them that, that actually, you know, your aesthetic is, is, is as important as musical and um, as inherently beautiful and, um, and, and, and full of excellence and quality as mine is, you know. And I just want to, I, I want to say that because it helps. Um, 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 it, it, I think it's part of this conversation and, and it's, and, and I feel like our minds are colonized and, and don't look at it that way. And certainly the presenters that are hiring me often, the funders, they all do the same thing too. You know, I'm, I, I definitely have cachet because I play the French horn. I have power within those communities, you know, if I play at a professional level and I use, I want to leverage whatever power I have as a fine artist, classical music to, to promote um, the voice of communities that I want to serve that I feel are underserved or unempowered. How can I do that? Through my French horn. Agreed. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just I'll do a little piggyback. Absolutely. That's why I said we are the they, because we have the power to change that um, within the, the culture that we set for our programs. We, we, whatever music it is that you're going to celebrate, celebrate it, you know, without apology. But we have to be um, able to get over our own hangups in order in order to do that. And I think that goes across the board for, for black led organizations, brown led organizations, as well as those that are not like it's just something that it's some work that we have to do. Thanks so much, Aisha. Um, any other questions? What what is coming up for you? This is the time to ask your questions there, or kickstart a conversation. Someone asking about Aaron Copeland's um, uh, Maybe Alexander can ask about it openly because I have something to say. This is definitely a part of this conversation and part of this colonized, post colonized aesthetic. I don't know if, if Alexander Ledes was still on the car willing to ask out loud um, their question. Are you willing to ask, ask out loud, Alexander Ledes? Sorry, I had to go grab my charger for my. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I just thought it was interesting um, how we talk about like the idea of a mariachi and how you say when I play with a mariachi, um, they say the same things like, oh, you, you can read all these symphony scores and stuff like that. But to me, it's almost more musical what they can do because it's an internalized like heart thing. It's not just, um, sorry, I had to run and catching my breath. Um, there's more soul to it almost in a way. Um, like you say, we play the same pieces over and over again by the same old white dudes. Um, and they're great pieces of music, but there's less of a representation. Um, so it's interesting when those composers like Aaron Copeland are inspired by those traditional folk styles 
And then it's appreciated as a classical masterpiece when it is really insp inspired by those like lesser musicians, mariachis or um, Brazilian. Stolen from. Stolen it's from. Stolen from, <laughs> exactly. It's colonized, like you say, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Like that's what it takes to, for it to be appreciated. Um, the, the bassoon is unique, especially in Brazilian culture. Um, I'm a Mexican bassoon player, but Brazilian music really speaks to me because there's such an adoption. They adopted the bassoon and created it into their own sound using European, you know, techniques, but they, they, they didn't allow their culture to be stomped out. So it's a kind of a cool thing that happened. It's like a creolization of music that is gross, but in a way inspiring because now it, it gives people like me, contemporary musicians, something to look back and see that, okay, yes, going forward, we can commission new pieces and we can change this idea by putting on be, these pieces on programs and putting on all Latin programs or all African-American composer programs. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's really interesting that way, like the music has such an effect. Um, so the, uh, the uh, concert series really, I think is awesome to do only composers of African-American or African diaspora music like that. I think that's really important because it starts with, with us individually as musicians. And then it trickles down to all of our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just wanted to say something about what reminded me when you were talking about Copeland or Moncayos, Wapango. Two two things. One is the the you know the pieces the the couple of pieces that are played by orchestras in the U.S. by Latino composers are of a very stereotypical aesthetic. You know, they're meeting, the orchestras are playing in a way, in a style, in a rhythm that they think sounds Latin American to them. Of course, we as Latinos have a plethora of all different styles that sound exactly as contemporary as classical as any European as well. But what the demand that they want is the stereotype style. That's what I find typically. Another thing, like for example, Aaron Copeland is in Mexico. Of course, he stole that style and he stole that aesthetic from, and, and that cultural identity and, and, and met the stereotype that the audience wanted to, wants to hear. Um, there, and I just want to say another thing about having a white male help ally. Okay, so I have a, I have a, I have a, a formula to create social change. That is, if I want to say something, and talk about racism or talk about some sort of change in organization if I have a white male helping me. So if I convince a white male that they have the same, they, they the older, the whiter, the whiter hair, the better. The, I, I can create much more change if I have an older white male next to me saying, yes, listen to Armando. No matter how much power I have in my situation. So I, just as a strategy for social change, it's, oh, it's a winning strategy. The more of them, the better. And, and I have a lot of allies and I look to them and I keep them close at hand because it's important to be able to create change. You know, whether it be a funder or another board member or another committee member or someone in the community that will hold my hand and, and while I speak, they say, yes, that person. So um, just as a, as a form of that reminded me when you were talking about Copeland, because in a way Copeland, even though he stole it, in a way it's kind of an ally in time because it's brought up so much. And if we can use that allyship and move the conversation towards more authentic, culturally competent Latin American composers, you know, that's an idea. Thanks, Armando. And um, I actually want to give the mic to Holly if you want to share something. I just want to pull out two terms, decolonizing the music room. What, what does that look like? And then also I want to bring out the term both end. You know, so it's not necessarily pushing for one or the other, but it's how do we do the both end and actually encompass representation, both end decolonizing the music room. Holly, do you, would you like to share a bit more? Yeah, um, thank you so much Armando and Aisha for sharing. I, so many things just popping in my head. Um, two of the things most recently when you were talking about just kind of internalized racism, I think for me, I teach in public schools, but for years I was a teaching artist. <clears throat> And I think learning how to arrange stuff, you know, if we look at people that are, you know, getting a master's in composing, they don't look like me. And my coworker was just like, just spend the summer arranging stuff because you can't go on JW Pepper and buy it. You can't. And so then what do we do? Like wait for JW Pepper to decide that they're going to somehow have black composers other than choral. I mean, if you go to choral, black male, other than that, there's nothing. And so, just 
I need to stop telling myself that I can't do it. I just need to get out there, do the work, you know, and um, yeah, just learning. I've had to learn. So as I commented, you know, people want to pick my brain. It's like, I went to a music school in the United States. I didn't just as you didn't, I didn't learn that stuff. And so I'm doing, I'm doing all this work and we want our students not just to replace the other faces or just make it more mixed up. It's like all, everyone has to learn this. We all need to learn it. Um, and then Aisha, when she was mentioning the teaching artists, I think there's just not a lot of support for teaching artists. So I'm just wondering how you build support for them, not to want to do the work, but to sustainably be able to do it. Just knowing that some people are working 10 jobs, three jobs, you know, as a teaching artist. So like, how do we, they want to, but the reality is that, like you said, we have to like conserve our energy and take care of ourselves and yeah. Yeah, that's 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 tough. I hear you. So, so kudos to you on, on doing your own arrangements. You have to. Um, and there are other people out there, you know, that you can find, but you have to actively seek them. And a lot of them, a lot of them don't do stuff on the level that um, our, our students are on, you know, so then there's that. But um, I think if more people realized that there was a large market for it, they would be more inclined uh, to write for some of our, so for some of our programs. So that's an idea. Um, and as far as the teaching artists engaged, I mean, that's tough. That's, that's, that's really tough. I mean, to be honest, Dante and I, uh, we say we have a, a saying that we um, we hire unicorns because the type of person that succeeds at AMP it's, it's it's really rare. You have to be really really good on your instrument and also a really good teacher. So you guys already know that in itself is hard, you know, because everybody can't teach or everybody can't play. So we got that. But then you have to be fully aware of the systematic racism that we're fighting through music at AMP and be willing to um, see our students not as charity, but as full, whole humans that you're going to nurture the musical gift in them. It's a lot that we're asking for. So um, they kind of almost come ready-made, honestly. And then just being in the, um, just being in the environment where we, I mean, we don't proclaim it, uh, you know, we don't articulate this, but it's an environment that, that boasts black excellence. And so when they see it and when they sense it, when they feel it, when they walk the halls, they're like, oh, so they just kind of like fall in line. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it, it has to come from the top down. I guess that's the answer to your question. It comes from the top down. So, you know, because, because we, set the, we set the stage for that, people kind of like walk into it. It would be hard to come into AMP and say, oh, you know, I've had that before. Oh, these kids, they can't, you know, I don't remember what he said, but these kids can't. I was like, mm -mm, no, no, no. You're not going to come here and tell me what these kids can't do because you're, you're already ruining everything. You know, so that person didn't last long. That was, but that was a mistake on my part. He wasn't ready for AMP. You know, you have to come and say, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going we're gonna to tear it up. What, what's, what's happening today? AMP is, is it's a crazy environment. It's dynamic. It's always changing. New opportunities popping up. Okay, now we're doing this. Now we're doing that. And you have to be the type of person that's ready to just dive in head first. And when you, when you are and when you um, have those sort of opportunities, you do whatever you can to get whatever done because we're project-based. So, you know, if we had, if we did decide to do some great Sistema collaboration next week, we would all, oh, I don't really know how to do this, but I'm going to figure it out. And so that's what's required of our teaching artists, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's because it seems so beautiful, you know, but we all know that it's just, I think what we're telling people is like, it's great to have allies, but this is a long term project. Sorry, my son. <laughs> you know, it's a long term thing and it's just like, it's not going to be just a feel good thing. It's going to be like, there's multiple systems in place that, you know, even for teaching artists, like, why don't they have the same benefits, the same, you know, that's like a, a different level that even individual organizations may not be able to help with, but it's something that needs to change. So yeah, thank you. For these, are, these are big, big system problems yes. that yes. policy problems that are that I'm, I'm finding as I getting older, I want to spend more time with as a bigger, larger impact. You know, one of the things that just reminded me of what you were saying, Holly, was something that we discuss sometimes is whether we should set up our own systems or work within systems that are there. Just when you said you're going to arrange your own music, like, okay, I can't, I can't wait. I'm just going to set up my own system and do my own music. That like, do we set up our own organizations and our, to, 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 to help the communities we want to serve or do we work with others? I don't have an answer. You know, I tend to do both, 
but I just wanted to put it out there. It's a, it's an open-ended question. I go back and forth. Thank you. So I'm wanting to be conscious of our time and respecting everyone's time, uh, noticing we have about one minute left. And I just want to say quickly that we are collecting a list of resources and Monique has saved all of the resources that are in the chat currently. So that is available. Um, if you would like to have access to those, please email Monique or Katie or myself and we can put our email addresses in the chat box. Um, and we want to keep this conversation going. So our the Equity Center Pedagogy Working Group um, does about six sessions a year. It's only June, so we're going to be doing more. Um, and if, if this conversation is something that you resonate with and that you feel energized about, please get in touch with us. We want to invite you to keep being part of the conversation. And um, I, I also just wanna say immense thanks to Aisha and Armando for sharing with us today. Um, as, as myself, someone who is white, trying to be an ally, I recognize that it's putting a lot of emotional labor on folks of color to share with us and uh, educate us. And we want to commit to doing our work and educating ourselves as well. So, but on behalf of the Equity Centered Pedagogy Working Group, thank you both so, so much. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you to everyone thank who's been a part of this call today. And I put, my, I put my phone number and my email inside the chat. So if anybody wants to talk about anything related to Latinx and classical music, ally or if you are latinx either way i'm uh, i'm feel ready to talk about it so hit me up okay i'm adding mine now <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much everyone this has been really wonderful and we'll talk again soon thank you <laughs>